In the last podcast, we focused on stakeholder attitudes that influence their judgments about how the organization in crisis is handling the issue by focusing on the effects of crisis severity and blame on evaluations of the organization's competence, commitment, and clear association towards managing those issues. In this podcast, we'll focus on better understanding the building blocks of the stakeholder's relationship with the organization. We now turn our focus to the organization because it builds on the discussion of attitudes and issues. So while I do like to think of the stakeholder relationship model as a love triangle, focusing on the two-way relationships between stakeholders' issues and the organization, if we're trying to understand the factors that build up stakeholder expectations for their relationship with the organization, we can also view it as a recursive process. What I mean by a recursive process is simply that the process moves through a series of steps, but at the end of that chain, it loops back on itself like we see depicted in this figure. So the figure demonstrates what I mean. If we start on the left with the stakeholder, as we did in the previous podcast, then we begin to lay the foundations, understanding that when crises occur, stakeholders' existing attitudes, experience with the organizations, perceptions of susceptibility, efficacy, and reaction to the crisis provides the context for how they'll react to the issue. Based on their existing attitudes, then, they make judgments about the issue and the organization's relationship to that issue. So in the middle box, they assess blame, they evaluate the severity of the crisis, and then they judge the organization's position on the crisis, as we discussed in the podcast after that. Those attitudes then inform their judgments about the organization and their relationship to that organization in the final box on the right. Then that loops back around to influence their general attitudes. So our task in this podcast is understanding what drives different kinds of evaluations of the organization in crisis. Stakeholder attitudes towards organizations in crisis represents the relationship in SRM that's been studied the most in crisis communication. Often treated as an outcome of crisis, these judgments have been assessed across multiple fields of study from communication and marketing to more industry specific studies in different areas like healthcare and tourism. If researchers and practitioners want to understand this relationship, they should be directly analyzing factors like changes to the organization's reputation. And there's an immense body of study on this, ranging from the evolution of the image restoration in the 1990s to studies of reputational crises themselves, and also to experimental evaluations of factors evaluating the impact of crisis on reputation. However, I've found that other factors, like the stakeholders perceived knowledge of the organization, not only changed under different crisis circumstances, but also influenced their overall perception of the crisis. For example, if a crisis made stakeholders feel like they had less knowledge about the organization, stakeholders were more likely to evaluate the organization negatively. Evaluations of stakeholders' attitudes towards organizations also tends to invoke more personal feelings about organizations, like assessments of whether an organization is fundamentally trustworthy, or whether they believe that the organization in crisis has values that are congruent to their own, or even whether they feel strong relationship satisfaction or loyalty to the organization in crisis. While we discussed each of the building blocks in earlier podcasts, here we'll focus on the specific factors that drive stakeholder evaluations of organizations. The first building block to stakeholder evaluations of organizations in crisis is, of course, the organization's reputation. Remember that reputation represents stakeholder perceptions of how an organization behaves, and especially how well they think that organization treats them and other stakeholders they know and care about. There are lots of studies highlighting how important an organization's reputation is before a crisis, but what makes for a good reputation? Turns out that there are really five factors. First is the organization's overall appeal to stakeholders. Appeal is related to the degree to which the organization and its product or services are likable and desirable. Second, 
the degree to which the organization is viewed as socially responsible. And this not only includes authentic corporate social responsibility initiatives, but also broader evaluations of its ethical behavior. Third, an evaluation of the quality of the organization's values and whether those values are evidenced in the organization's actions. Fourth, whether the organization itself is viewed as a credible source of information, particularly about the crisis itself. And fifth, whether stakeholders believe that the organization can even survive the crisis as a viable organization. And remember, in our last podcast, I introduced reputational threat as a multi-step process combining evaluations of severity and blame attribution by considering what kind of crisis situation intensifiers would most likely affect stakeholder attitudes. Previous research suggests there are two critical situational intensifiers that will affect mostly an organization's reputation, its competence in managing the crisis and its trustworthiness. We should think of an organization's reputation as representing a judgment that stakeholders make about what they can expect from the organization. Previous research demonstrates that different types of crises then produce different types of damage to an organization's reputation and the loss of trust from its stakeholders. We've already talked about expectancy violation theory in the discussion of why crises can cause problems for organizations in complex environments. Let's take a look at it again in terms of how it affects stakeholder evaluations of the organization's reputation as well. In a context where publics are increasingly building expectations for behavior on organizations based on its existing reputation, then expectancy violation theory is the bridge to explain why we often see negative reactions to crises. An organization may have violated its stakeholders' expectations for it. This is also one of the reasons why Coombs and Holiday identify so corporate social responsibility as a potential risk to an organization's reputation with the emergence of the crisis. If the company's reputation was built on being good and it's found out to have committed a transgression, then its reputation probably has further to fall. If we think about the Volkswagen emissions scandal that emerged in 2015, where the company was found to have falsified its tests, the company's reputation was seriously damaged because the reputation itself was built on integrity and quality. Trustworthiness is our second building block, and it also has a number of judgments that contribute to it, along with crisis-specific situational intensifiers. So let's take a closer look at these. Underlying reputation and this process of assessing reputational threat is a more fundamental concept, an organization's trustworthiness. Trust in organizations are evaluations of its positive expectations about the intent and behaviors of the organization. To be trusted, an organization must have integrity, that is, its stakeholders believe that the organization's values are aligned with their own. Naturally, this is also related to assessments of an organization's social responsibility. Previous research demonstrate that different types of crises produce different types of damage to the stakeholders' relationship with the organization, including both a loss of reputation and trust. For example, research finds that violations of integrity are more damaging than violations of competence because the integrity violation points to a moral failure versus, say, a personnel or procedural failure. Kramer and Lewicki emphasize that violations of trust are often based in unmet expectations, such as broken promises, the inability to perform, or behaviors that are misaligned with core values. I've argued that values and identity shape how stakeholders react to crises. But at this point, it should also be clear that they shape how stakeholders react to organizations as well. So the third building block for stakeholder evaluations is value congruence. Value congruence represents the degree to which organizations see a similarity between their own values and the values demonstrated by the organization. This is why an organization's culture, 
as it's manifested in the demonstrable forms of its ideology, as well as its social responsibility initiatives, should be considered as contributing to an organization's crisis capacity, because as long as the organization's behavior is well aligned with the values that its stakeholders have, then the stakeholders' perception of their relationship with the organization should remain relatively undamaged. Value congruence can also explain why organizations can experience crises, but seemingly few negative effects for those crises. Because if the organization's response is well aligned with stakeholder values, then quite simply the crisis doesn't threaten the relationship. For example, several years ago, Bayer Aspirin had a very short-lived campaign in the U.S. targeting women who had back pain as part of its broader campaign for all of life's little pains. The way that they tried to build the campaign's narrative, what Bayer did was explain that it was natural for mothers to experience back pain, and that was evidenced in picking up children, doing household chores, and so on. But they tried to inject a bit of humor into the campaign by using a double entendre to refer to all of life's little pains as being both the back pain and the toddlers depicted in the commercial. Several hundred moms signed a letter of complaint to the company suggesting that they were offended at the suggestion that their child could be pains. Apparently, they were unmoved by the humor. Now, instead of dismissing the complaint, the company issued a personal apology to each and every one of the signatories and pulled the campaign. Yes, this cost them money, but the same Mom's group paid them back with praise and appreciation of the company's sensitivity to their concerns. In this way, what Bayer had successfully communicated to the group and to the broader American public was that the company genuinely cared about the same things their consumers did. Even if that cost them money, they would protect their consumers' interests. In short, their response to the reputational crisis demonstrated strong value congruence, and so instead of damaging the relationship, it improved it. In the Bear case, by demonstrating value congruence, the company was able to reconnect its values with its stakeholders, and messages of thanks for Bear's response also seemed to reaffirm what the moms had thought about the company before the campaign. Had Bayer's response been different, aside from losing value congruence, it's also possible that the company could have shaken these stakeholders' confidence in what they knew to be true about the company. Therefore, the fourth building block is perceived knowledge. Going hand in hand with this is efficacy. That's the confidence in what people believe to be true. Efficacy underpins most of our decisions and actions, yet crises are challenging because they create uncertainty. For organizations experiencing crisis, this is problematic because many of the indicators of the stakeholder's relationship with the organization rely on stakeholder confidence in the organization's trustworthiness and value congruence, just like we've discussed. But trustworthiness and value congruence represent stakeholder judgments that are rooted in both enduring identities like culture, as well as existing attitudinal constructs like uncertainty. Efficacy and identities are important because they not only give us a sense of belonging and morality, but they also provide expectations for the behavior that leaves us confident about how we should think and act. However, a crisis can threaten what we think we know about the organization. Consistently, I have found that if a crisis makes stakeholders feel like they have less knowledge about an organization, then they are more likely to evaluate that organization in crisis much more negatively. In most cases, this was one of the strongest predictors of the stakeholders evaluation of the organization. And if it significantly changes, then it's a good indicator in the way that stakeholders see their relationship with the organization, either positively or negatively. Our final building block is identification. When stakeholders view their relationship with an organization as satisfactory, they'll often feel loyal to the organization. This is akin to the concept of identification. Though identification is usually framed in terms of how members of an organization feel about it, in a modern social media context, it's just as applicable to other stakeholders as well. Research has explored the self-organization connection, finding that no matter the stakeholder, either internal or external, 
having a positive image led to greater stakeholder attachment to the organization. So organizational identification focuses on how attached stakeholders are to the organization. Attachment forms when the stakeholder connects their own self-concept, that is, like their values, with the organization. This produces perceptions of mutual connectedness, loyalty, and satisfaction with the organization. So this grounds an identification continuum where at its most positive, stakeholders see themselves cooperating with the organization in the range of ways to co-create value of the organization in the public sphere. Alternatively, if the identification is negative, stakeholders may see themselves as adversaries, actively working against the brand. We'll address both of these ends of the continuum in the next podcast as we explore brand communities and counter branding. But in a crisis context, the challenge is how to ensure that stakeholders view their relationship as cooperative and not adversarial. But should the identification with the organization change, then that suggests a meaningful change in the nature of the relationship directly caused by the crisis. Thank you.